88.1 KFCF in Fresno and online at kpsa.org. It's 1.30. Up next is Making Contact. This week on Making Contact. It was four days after they murdered Fred Hampton in this bed. In Chicago, they shot at me in the bed and tried to do the same thing. The Counterintelligence Program, or COINTELPRO, was a secret FBI project to infiltrate and disrupt domestic organizations thought to be subversive. Between 1956 and 1971, the FBI conducted more than 2,000 COINTELPRO operations, targeting black, brown, Asian, and indigenous movements for self-determination. If you involve in radical politics, if you involve in certain forms of even civil disobedience, that you might be charged as a terrorist in this particular country. On this edition, part two of the documentary film COINTELPRO 101, produced by the Freedom Archives. I'm Andrew Stelzer, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. The Black Panther Party was only a, little, a small manifestation of what this infrastructure wanted to do. Geronimo Pratt, Black Panther Party and former political prisoner. I'm talking about SNCC. Came up with these brilliant ideas, you know, that had nothing to do with a Huey Newton or a Bobby Seale. We were organizing in the South, in the West, in the East, the symbol of the Panther from the Mississippi Freedom and Democratic Party, Andy Lou Hamer, all these people I knew I'm growing up with we see. If you're right, you have to stand on that principle and if it's necessary to die on the principle because I am sick of the racist war in Vietnam when we don't have justice in the United States. The militant aspects, is all, it's already there from the deacons on. This is what you did. We grew up in a black nation, a nation that had to protect itself. We are concerned about the survival of black people in this country and that we cannot survive if we go fight some yellow man in Vietnam who ain't never called us nigger. The government saw it as a black Marxist movement growing in the north. Mohammed Ahmad, Revolutionary Action Movement. We were independent of the Communist Party. We were independent of the Socialist Workers Party. We were independent of all left groups that they had already infiltrated. It was wrong. But you also had the Chicano movement developing, uh, Asian American, anti-imperialist, uh, national liberation, consciousness type movement. And in the Puerto Rican community, you had the development of that as well as with white students. Professor of African American Studies at Georgia State University, Akinyeli Umoja. So, you know, uh, in terms of development of a different type of politics, it scared the hell out of the United States government at that particular moment. And that's why counterinsurgency was developed at that level. In the past, the poor neighborhoods have been exploited by persons or person or persons who have been less than American. There's so many of these anti or, or anti-American, uh, pink, uh, even red organizations. The FBI and the Department of Justice would learn everything about people in a particular organization. Attorney Bob Doyle. And they did that through wiretaps of telephones, of planting bugs in offices, and using informants. The Red Squad, there are those units within the police department or any law enforcement unit that uh, have as their function the investigating and looking into organizations that perhaps are a little on the suspect side or have uh, revealed themselves uh, in such a way as to be a little bit questionable. Laura Whitehorn, activist and former political prisoner. The FBI broke into our houses. And you would know this because you would come home and you could tell your house had been broken into. Door was locked. Nothing was taken except for maybe some papers. But things were rearranged. Black Panther Party member and attorney Kathleen Cleaver. The FBI had a way of classifying people who were in the Black Panther Party in many categories, one of which was called the Key Agitator Index. Those are the people who they targeted to be neutralized. Constitutional rights were not a consideration. They were, in fact, secretly and unilaterally suspended by the FBI with at least the tacit approval of high officials in the federal government. Ward Churchill, Native American activist and author. For purposes of neutralizing, that's the term 
that was used within the program itself by those FBI officials who were responsible neutralized the political activities that were considered objectionable on the part of the Bureau undertaken by U.S. citizens. Gee, why don't I just have one of my informants in another organization go out and shoot this guy and make it look like some kind of a mixed-up drug operation. Wesley Swearingen, former FBI special agent. And, you know, have him assassinated. That'll neutralize him for sure. At approximately 2.45 p.m. this afternoon, two men were murdered at the UCLA campus. At UCLA, you had Bunchy Carter, Al Prentice Carter, who was basically the head of the Los Angeles chapter of the Black Panther Party, along with another Panther named John Huggins, who was a key organizer down there, killed by... Uh, federal undercover personnel, basically, in a classroom at the University of California, Los Angeles. This was in uh, Campbell Hall. And, it, you know, it was just, just cold. They were eliminated. The FBI took credit for that result in its internal memoranda. Wesley Swearingen. Why don't you first talk about the agents, uh, the assassination of Carter and Hugginson. Los Angeles and Hawaii, sure. Uh, but I found out later that uh, he wasn't just joking with me, it was true. For what I'm to found. Had to do with a disinformation campaign in order to set two political organizations, both of which had been infiltrated, at odds with one another, creating context in which. instance, certain of the infiltrators could eliminate bona fide activists on the other side. So you then have the FBI agent in charge, a guy by the name of Richard Wallace Held, who now runs security for the Visa Corporation. Agent Held talked about how successful the operation had been, and on that basis sought approval for it to be continued. The approval was given. You then have two more Panthers who are killed in San Diego. I said, those aren't the only two assassinations. I said, and two in uh, Chicago. Most famously, perhaps, and best documented, they have the Hampton-Clark assassinations. Fred Hampton, deputy chairman of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. If we didn't talk about a Breakfast of Children program, we've got one. We're not going to tell you how many kids went to the Freedom Speed in Chicago. We're feeding 3,000 to 4,000 every week already, and I don't know how many all around the country. And Mark Clark, who was defense captain for a downstate chapter in Peoria, who was staying in the apartment rented by Mr. Hampton, on the 4th of December 1969 when the FBI caused a police arms raid to be executed on the premises. The result of which, and this is the cleanest version of it, is that Mr. Hampton and Mr. Clark were shot to death by the police. And the cops lied about it. Laura Whitehorn. And state's attorney Edward Hanrahan lied about it, and he was clearly in on it. It came out. The family proved it. They did that to decapitate the movement. We said even before this happened, and we're going to say it after this, and after I'm locked up, and after everybody's locked up, that you can jail revolutionaries, but you can't jail a revolution. You might run a liberator like Eric Cleave out the country, but you can't run liberation out the country. You might murder a freedom fighter like Bobby Hutton, but you can't murder freedom fighting, and if you do, you come up with answers that don't answer explanations that don't explain. You come up with conclusions that don't conclude. Nothing's more important than stopping fascism because fascism will stop us all. The government wanted to wipe out the Panthers and the Young Lords later and the American Indian Movement and, and Weatherman and other parts of the white progressive movements because they saw that there was something that was in flames and they wanted to put it out and the easiest way to put it out was counterinsurgency. In the United States, the government isn't supposed to use counterinsurgency against its own citizens. Black Panther Party member Joan Byrd. Things lives have become so extremely outlandish that they were forced to resort to their ultimate weapon. Forced Organized force, murder, and brutality against black people, and the attacks against the Black Panther Party escalated. The very night, January 17, 1969, that I was being tortured, which Bunchy Carter and John Huggins were shot by the flunkies of this government. Bob Doyle. There were numerous false arrests and prosecutions where people spent 
long time in prison uh, on trumped up charges. On April 2nd of 1969, I was rearrested along with 21 other members of the Black Panther Party on charges of conspiracy to murder some pigs and attacks against our party still escalated. For example, there was the Panther 21 case in New York where the leadership was basically arrested, spent two years in jail before they were acquitted on all charges. But as a result, the New York chapter was virtually decimated. It was Geronimo Pratt. Four days after they murdered Fred Hampton in this bed, in Chicago, they shot at me in the bed and tried to do the same thing. Kathleen Cleaver. One of the key agitators and one of the targets to be neutralized that was very important to them was a young uh, Vietnam vet who had come to Los Angeles to study. He went to college at UCLA on the GI Bill. His name was Elmer Geronimo Pratt. And he was seemed to have been targeted very, very early on. Wesley Swearingen. Well, the FBI had gotten rid of uh, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins and now, now they got Geronimo Pratt. It took their place. And they got to get rid of him. COINTELPRO had an intense interest in the Los Angeles Black Panthers. And at certain point, uh, the LAPD SWAT team attacked the office front on, just, just cleared the streets and started shooting. Geronimo had taught people how to fortify the office. And they tried to bomb the office, and um, it had been sandbagged, and so that didn't work. And eventually, people surrendered. Then they really hated Geronimo because they felt that he had frustrated their desire to destroy the uh, office. Geronimo was not a violent person. He, he, he definitely was not. That was the thing that bugged the FBI. So if they had already worked you know, two assassinations, uh, the third one might have been a chairman. Uh, they might have been discovered, so they worked out something else, which was just as effective. They got him in jail for 25 years. They put a murder on me that they were able to manipulate in such a way that it stuck. A murder that would keep me the, uh, a life sentence. I was on the squad. I know he was framed. Liz Darius. FBI documents later revealed that their own surveillance placed Geronimo in Oakland at the time of the murders, not in Los Angeles. Gene Hamilton was a juror in Geronimo Pratt's case. I don't think there's any doubt that the decision would have been different if we had the amount of information that is available now. We had no clue as to what the government could do or what they did do. Even though Vietnam was going on, you couldn't believe that your government was doing that at home to one of its own citizens, not only one of its own citizens, one of its own veterans. And uh, they really put that together in such a way that anything that we did to try to bring out the truth was already preempted, you know. So this is uh, what they used to keep me in prison for 27 years and to criminalize our revolutionary positions. The whole basis of his political activity, the activity that disturbed the government, that disturbed the status quo, Ward Churchill, had been essentially neutralized. He was unable to do that, so the mission was accomplished. That was a successful operation. We'll be right back. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. We now return to part two of Freedom Archives, COINTELPRO 101. In the investigation conducted by the United States Senate Committee on Intelligence with respect to governmental operations, short term is the Church Committee. Kathleen Cleaver. They... Said, I think it was 235 separate actions of COINTELPRO were targeted against the Black Panther Party. So, you know, every chapter that was of any substance was subjected to this. And there are people who've lost their lives, there are people who've lost their mind, there are people who were completely hostile to anything to do with the Black Panthers because they were abused. The only reason why I'm here is I disappeared for four years. Muhammad Ahmad. You know. Many of my comrades have fallen. You know, apartments broken into. Some uh, had security 
apartments and been found handcuffed to the chair and shot in the back of the head. So it's a continuum of disruption or what they call destabilization, just like they destabilize nations, they're destabilizing the entire uh, uh, radical movement one way or another. COINTELPRO was a highly secret program and its crimes might not have been exposed were it not for a group of anti-war activists in Pennsylvania. April of 1971, some anti-war activists, Bob Doyle, broke into the FBI field office in Media, Pennsylvania, which also housed the offices of the Selective Service Administration. And this was a time when there was still a draft. And the goal of these activists was to break in, open the drawers, and burn selective service records, draft cards, to keep people from getting drafted. So they broke into this office, started opening up the file cabinets, and lo and behold, it was an FBI office, and they saw documents entitled Counterintelligence Program Black Nationalist Hate Groups. And they started reading these documents took them didn't burn them thank goodness and gave them to um, the press in addition at least three domestic subversive targets were the subject of numerous entries from October 1952 to June 1966 members of the press did their own investigations which ultimately then led to in the mid 1970s an investigation by Senator Frank Church which became known as the Church Committee which conducted an investigation into all aspects of government misconduct and surveillance of political organizations in the 50s, 60s, and the 70s. Senator Frank Church. We're dealing also with the FBI, a law enforcement agency in this country. And if the law enforcement agencies that are charged with enforcing the law don't themselves obey the law, then who will? Our problem with the CIA has not had to do with its foreign operations, but has had to do with, with uh, violations of the law, which says that the CIA stays out of the domestic affairs of the United States. There was a real purpose for that. The purpose was trying to preserve a free society and not let an intelligence agency in the name of national security begin to erode away the foundations of freedom in our own land. What you see is the government, the government taking it upon itself, the supervision of what is allowed politically and what is not allowed politically. And when those decisions are made by essentially an organization that's a political police force, such as the FBI, or intelligence agencies like the CIA or the Department of Defense Intelligence, when those kind of people are making decisions of what is politically appropriate for the citizens to do, then we don't have a democracy. Then we have essentially a police state because they're only, the police are deciding what can happen. And so that's the fundamental uh, crime of the COINTELPRO program. Whether there's stress or turbulence doesn't really excuse agencies, law enforcement agencies of the government or the president himself from rising above the law and proceeding in lawless fashion. The FBI admitted Jose Lopez, Puerto Rican Cultural Center. To the Congress of the United States, that they had over a million documents on the Puerto Rican independence movement. A million documents on a movement of a very small island. And it speaks to how important the COINTEL Pro program has been vis a -vis the Puerto Rican independence movement. They actually intensified with a lot of money their attacks, which largely con uh, Geronimo Pratt. A comprised of illegal tactics to make the criminal the victim and the victim the criminal to turn everything around. So we couldn't win the hearts and minds of the people if we wanted to. So we will begin to be looked upon as the uh, enemies of the people instead of what we were. Freedom fighter, fighting for people. So they're using mind games, manipulation, deceit to create confusion, dissension, and 
end up destroying the leadership. Um, I was in the middle of that, and I would say that the repercussions of that kind of COINTELPRO operation are still present. Whether the death of Ricardo Falcón was an assassination... Priscilla Falcón, professor of Hispanic studies at the University of Northern Colorado. Or not. It had a very chilling effect on social movements, on communities not only in Colorado, not only in the community that he was born in, but in communities across the United States, across the Southwest. It said to people, if you dare to go out into community and begin to make social change, and then you are going to have to pay a heavy price for that. No one was ever punished for the illegal activities of government agencies under the COINTELPRO programs. Some people paid a high price for fighting back or resisting this government-led war against progressive movements. George Jackson was one of the black movement leaders targeted by COINTELPRO for assassination in prison. And some people are still paying a high price. Those who are political prisoners, those who remain locked up some 20, 30, and 40 years later. This is Mumia Abu-Jamal, a former Black Panther who continues to write and broadcast radio commentaries after decades of unjust imprisonment. Many of us have been part of national liberation movements, revolutionary political parties, anti-racist communes, or in the case of people like the Cuban Five, anti-terrorism activists. We've been tried in tribunals where our politics have been our crime, and our political associations our felonies. We need a movement of millions to bring freedom to the brothers and sisters of the Move 9, to bring freedom to Sundiata Akali, to bring freedom to Mutulu Shakur, and hundreds of other political prisoners. We need a movement of millions to make common cause with oppressed people the world over. Attorney Bob Doyle. COINTELPRO is happening today on many different levels and is a lot more sophisticated. And in fact, it doesn't need to be a secret anymore. I believe that it is our ability, Jose Lopez, to transform that repression into meaningful discussion. Because it's not just about us saying, well, we need to take the state head on. It is also to engage people in reflections in their homes, in everywhere, to think about not what historically has been done because of COINTELPRO, what is being done right now. How is COINTELPRO really uh, the rubric for um, the Patriot Act and, ho and many aspects of Homeland Security. Ricardo Romero, Al Frente de Lucha. If it was COINTELPRO then, it's probably COINTELPRO now. Maybe a different version or a different name. The same practice is to eliminate, intimidate, incarcerate, and terrorize a people. Kathleen Cleaver. Certain kinds of searches that were illegal or unconstitutional now under Patriot Act, they can be done. Akinyeli Umoja. If you involved in radical pro politics, if you're involved in certain forms of even civil disobedience, that you might be charged as a terrorist in this particular country. In Puerto Rico, there is, I believe, a growing movement to really understand the role of the FBI, particularly with the assassination of Filiberto Gerard Rios. The FBI pursued Rios, an independence movement leader, for 15 years after he failed to appear for sentencing on robbery charges. On September 23, 2005, the FBI murdered him during an assault on his home in Puerto Rico. That led many people to really question the role of the FBI. Ward Churchill. What they call this, this great green scare of the last few years. The radical environmental movement, for lack of a better term, this was showcased as being an example of 
so-called domestic terrorism, although I don't know that it's ever been shown that they hurt anyone. Now the people who are the most serious, most principled activists, are in a position of being made into examples of the cost and consequence. Disproportionately harsh, ridiculous sentences, if you want to think about it, under the rubric of terrorism. Now, under the Patriot Act, there doesn't even have to be any crime. People can just be investigated. And guess what? They get investigated because of their politics. They get put on lists. They get under surveillance. Uh, there's all kinds of things that happen to people. They can be whisked off into prisons that no one even knows where they are. They can be tortured. They can be brutalized. These are the things that were being done under COINTELPRO as well. But the government said they weren't happening because they were illegal. They could have been charged for violating the law. But now, that is the law. Mohammed Ahmad. There are young people looking for answers. And there are enough victims of COINTELPRO around from the 60s and 70s in every community to warn young people of the traps. Chicano and Mexicano activist and attorney Francisco Martinez. There are yet people who have raw wounds walking around from those years. And as long as those wounds don't heal, and as long as society doesn't let them heal, there will be another generation who sees those wounds and will, make, will, will take those wounds personally and will make the future revolutionaries who will, we hope, link up someday to people from the other continents who are also oppressed and maybe make for a little improvement. The organized resistance and claims for social and human justice, for political democracy, for economic democracy, have to go into the forefront and we have to have broader and broader coalitions and stronger and stronger movements and it has to make a political impact. And so we cannot just say, well, because it's hard, we can't do it. No, it has to be done. It is a long and protracted struggle, but you cannot abandon it, and you have to recognize, as James Foreman always said, we will win without a doubt. The quest for freedom, the quest for equality, and the quest for community. And I think that that's something that systems of greed and oppression try to deny, and I think we have a right but more important, our responsibility to take those things head on and um, to be part of building movements of resistance. Ultimately, the only safety that we'll be able to secure and pass along to our coming generations is not only to confront the nature of the reality reflected in COINTELPRO and comparable sorts of operations from Homeland Security or whoever, but to dismantle the system that gives rise to them and replace it with something that would actually reflect our interests, that would reflect concern with our well-being, and reflect a certain sort of respect for the dignity of our communities, our traditions, and us as individuals. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. Special thanks to Freedom Archives. To hear a full-length version of the film or find out if it's being screened in your local community, go to our website, radioproject.org. I'm Andrew Stelzer. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. Happy ending. This is Jennifer Stone with a few words about my show, Stone's Throw, every Tuesday, three in the afternoon. I get half an hour to throw myself into this fight for the future. What we're trying to do here is resist the darkness. I think truth and beauty are still dating. The eternal feminine leads me on. Politicians can be poets in my world. I try on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock. The show is Stone's Throw 
Until then, go easy, and if you can't go easy, go as easy as you can.